I'm going to attempt to do this as sort of a lecture on morphogenesis and the different types of morphogenesis we can have. So in the group we talk a lot about the Turing morphogenesis, which is probably the most common type of morphogenesis. And we talk about the Gray-Scott model sometimes as well, which is kind of a variation on the Turing morphogenesis. But actually morphogenesis is a much larger topic. And if you go to the Wikipedia pages associated with morphogenesis, you know, they have a discussion on this. I'll draw a little bit, tiny bit from some of the Wikipedia entries, but also some of the other uh, things that I've kind of collected on this topic. So I'm going to divide this up into different dimensions of morphogenesis, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and then talk about Laplacian growth in bacteria, which is outside the realm of what we think about as say, embryogenetic morphogenesis, but is nevertheless morphogenesis. It's just that we have it characterized in a different way. So the first example is one-dimensional morphogenesis. The first example is this Raleigh-Bernard convection, and this can be seen here in this video. This red flow at the bottom, the blue flow at the top. This fluid, these fluid flows are going to migrate towards one another. And as they flow towards one another, you get these, these fluid dynamics these turbulent fluid dynamics moving towards one another. So we're going to eventually, I guess it's going to come together into this, it almost looks like a painting, um, but you see these eddies in, in these turbulent flows and the colors are mixed. So you have red regions, blue regions, light blue regions, orange regions and so forth, just the colors mixing together in this flow. So if you can think of if you had uh, two, you know, if you had two dyes that were coming together in a turbulent flow from different directions and they merge together and then they form this, these dynamics, which actually don't resemble the uh, advancing wave fronts anymore, they're mixed together. But you can still see that there's forcing from either direction Sometimes you get sort of this aggregation in different places in the model, and sometimes you get these vortices that form. Some of them are dark blue, some of them are dark red, but some of them are kind of mixed around the edges. This is a paper on recent developments in Raleigh-Bernard convection. So, you know, what we observed is like kind of a one-dimensional uh, convection. We had like a two-dimensional image, but if you can think of this as sort of convection going down one dimension, a one-dimensional gradient, you get the idea. So this is a form of one-dimensional genesis. And so we have, uh, this review summarizes results for Raleigh-Bernard convection that have been obtained over the past decade or so. It concentrates on convection in compressed gases and gas mixtures with parental numbers near one and smaller. These parental numbers are parameter that they use in fluid mechanics. In addition to the classical problem of a horizontal stationary fluid layer heated from below, so those that migration of fluid that we saw was driven by some heat source. So heat is being applied to the system and it's driving this fluid layer. So the fluid layer can be driven by a simple forcing mechanisms at one end of the one dimensional uh, gradient and then it's moving down the gradient and oftentimes it won't necessarily mix. It'll just kind of drive down in a turbulent fashion and maybe reach a boundary where it can convect, you know, they can convect around, the flow can convect around and form these patterns as well. So the example I showed was just an example for the benefit of your vision, but this can definitely be implemented in a one-dimensional context. Uh, it also briefly covers convection in such a layer with rotation ab about a vertical axis with inclination with modulation of the vertical acceleration. So this isn't necessarily a biological system that we typically think of with cells. This could be achieved with fluid, even, uh, you know, an inorganic fluid of some type. You know, we don't have like biological components that are being organized. It's just chemicals maybe. But this is an example of one-dimensional morphogenesis. So fluid motion driven by thermal gradients or thermal convection is a common and important phenomenon in nature. Convection is a major feature of the dynamics of the oceans, the atmosphere, the interior of stars and planets. So if you think about systems in the oceans, 
like collectives of plankton or something like that, they could exhibit this kind of morphogenesis. Although I don't have any examples of that. So, you know, we can think of other microorganisms that are, you know, maybe more suitable for this model. The point being is that we can get this kind of one-dimensional morphogenesis. And it's very a very different mechanism than the Turing morphogenesis. For many years, the quest for the understanding of convective flows has motivated numerous experimental and theoretical studies, and so they go through this. But they talk about pattern formation in spatially extended systems, which is interesting because Turing and Turing morphogenesis, we often talk about those same things. So in spatially extended systems, convection usually occurs when a sufficiently steep temperature gradient is applied across the fluid layer. So usually this is where the fluid becomes turbulent or is separated by a steep temperature gradient. Usually a temperature input at, or a heat input at one end and non-heat input at the other end. This could also work in the oceans where you have uh, across layers of the ocean where you go from like sunlight to darkness, where you go from a, a heated upper layer to a cooler lower layer. Uh, the spatial variation of a convection structure often is referred to as a pattern. The nature of such convection patterns is at the center of this review. Pattern formation is determined by nonlinear aspects of the system under study. For this reason, the elucidation of pattern formation was a challenging problem in condensed matter physics as well as fluid mechanics. And so pattern formation is also a common factor in many other spatially extended nonlinear non-equilibrium systems. Patterns observed in diverse systems are often strikingly similar. And their understanding in terms of general unifying concepts has long been a main direction of research. So this is something we have to think about, not just in terms of its own dynamics, but you know how we can apply it to other types of systems that have outputs that look similar. And of course, as we know the lesson from that that we talked about earlier, is that just because things look similar in a qualitative way doesn't mean that they're the same thing. But also, if you have things that are characterized with different types of models, they might actually be sort of the same phenomenon. This is an example you can find outside of fluid dynamics, and this is called Fisher's equation. So this was something that Ronald Fisher developed, and it actually goes back to the early days of population biology and population genetics. Fisher's equation captures this sort of phenomena where we use partial differential equations, and we can see an example here, to model a kind of reaction diffusion system that models what we call wave propagations. So as you saw in the original uh, video I showed you, you have these propagating waves of turbulent fluid, and they're coming together, and they're, form they're forming this mixture that's high, you know, that has really rich dynamics. In this case, what we're doing is we're using a uh, partial differential equation to model a reaction diffusion system. We're using a wave of some type to model that wave and then to model population growth along with wave propagation. And this is the kind of simulation result you can get for that. So Fisher's equation belongs to the class of reaction diffusion equations. So there are a whole class of reaction diffusion equations. So the idea is that in a population, you have members of the population that are interacting. And in this case, you might look at like the frequencies of genes as those individuals reproduce and produce offspring and, you know, and or interact with their neighbors. You get different frequencies of, you know, alleles. And you can actually model that not just in terms of their uh, overall frequency, but you can model them in space. And so when you model them in space, they form these waves that propagate throughout the population or propagate throughout space. And so certain configurations can dominate that space over time. And so this is uh, one of the simplest semi-linear reaction diffusion equations, the one that has the inhomogeneous term, this fuxt, which is, of course, uh, ru1 minus u. So this is a very easy equation to work out. This exhibits traveling wave solutions that switch between equilibrium states given by function f u equals zero. So at equilibrium, you get this, these solutions that switch between different equilibrium states. Such e equations occur in ecology, physiology, 
combustion, crystallization, plasma physics, and other problems in null phase transitions. But this actually comes out of this work in 1937 on the wave of advance of advantageous genes. So this is how basically genes propagate or advantageous genes or alleles propagate through an evolving population. And so, you know, this is very different from your fluid dynamics example. Different dynamics, different transmission dynamics, but we still get the same phenomenon that we can use to model these these kinds of things. And so this kind of goes, this is from Wikipedia, this goes through some of these, uh, the details of the equations. But what's really interesting about this is that you can take this idea of one dimensional morphogenesis and apply it to a large number of systems, not just fluid dynamics. Now we get to two dimensional morphogenesis. And of course, this is our Gray Scott model. This is Gray Scott on a torus. So this is the Gray Scott model, which is mapped to a torus. And you can see that there are these propagating patterns across the surface of the torus. Uh, so you have these different. Uh, growth centers that kind of merge together and they form this complex pattern. This looks like something you, you might see on the uh, coat of a lizard or something. And so this is showing how this propagates across this two-dimensional surface. This is actually a three-dimensional torus, but the idea is that you would have like a flat surface and it would propagate across in both your X and your Y dimension. So this process is driven by two-dimensional uh, set of interactions. So we can talk about the Gray-Scott model, we can talk about the Turing model, but we can also talk about another set of models. And one of these, of course, so let's, let's first of all go to this one. So this is an example of our Gray-Scott model torus here. And we can talk about reaction diffusion systems more generally. Uh, reaction diffusion systems are mathematical models which correspond to several different physical phenomena. The most common is the change in space and time of the concentration of one or more chemical substances. So we have, in two dimensions, we have space versus time. So we can look at things in space along one dimension, time along one dimension, or we're going to multiple spatial dimensions and use time as sort of an evolving parameter. So we can look at different chemical reactions in different locations in two-dimensional space and how those diffuse across different constituents and how they may change their state or how chemical reactions can spread in two dimensions and generalize it out to say like a three-dimensional torus. Or we can look at that time dimension versus that one-dimensional space and we can look at like a chemical substance that's moving over time. And so we can do the model this in a number of ways. We have these local chemical reactions in which the substances are transformed into each other, and diffusion, which causes the substances to spread out over a surface in space. So we have reactions and we have diffusions. So the reactions change the state of something locally. Diffusions are movement of the signal across space. We can actually think of the reaction and the diffusion as the two dimensions as well. Reaction diffusion systems are naturally applied in chemistry. However, the system can also describe dynamical processes of non-chemical nature. So those examples are found in biology, geology, and physics. So you find this in geology with rock formations and, and uh, biogeochemistry. You find this, of course, in biology with uh, morphogenesis and in other uh, forms of this reaction diffusion type of model. We find it in physics, we find it in ecology. Mathematically, our reaction diffusion system takes the form of semi-linear parabolic partial differential equations, which can be represented in this form. And we can do this with, you know, uh, working in one spatial dimension in plane geometry. We have this traveling wavefront solution for Fisher's equation, which we saw in the example of one-dimensional morphogenesis. And then we can have two component reaction diffusion equations. So two component systems allow for a much larger range of possible phenomena than their one component counterparts. The way they treat this is they think of the one dimensional morphogenesis as the one component reaction, basically just like a reaction system or a diffusion system. In this case, we have a two component reaction diffusion system. So those things are separated out instead of being treated together. 
So two component systems allow for a much larger range of possible phenomena. An important idea was then first proposed by Alan Turing is that they, that is stable in the local system can become unstable in the presence of diffusion. So in other words, if you have something that's stable in a reaction, that's fine in the local system. If you diffuse that signal and it becomes global, then it can become unstable. So if you think about your, you know, how you have it in Turing morphogenesis where you have your different gradients. If you're in one chemical gradient, something might be stable. If you move to the other chemical gradient, it might become unstable. And so this is why you have boundary formation where two gradients come together, because in that case, those two gradients are diffusing, and then at some point they interact, and that interaction causes an instability, which then builds that, that boundary. And so this is an important part of this kind of model, the two-dimensional model, or two-dimensional morphogenesis, is that there are two different components, there are two different compartments that we model it in. So this is an example of a subcritical Turing bifurcation, where we get the formation of a hexagonal pattern for noisy initial conditions in the above two component reaction diffusion system. So this is getting kind of previewing the Fitzhugh Nagumo type of reaction diffusion system. This is where we have noisy initial conditions at t equals zero, so in time equals zero. And then you have the state of the system at 10 iterations where you start to get these sort of formations, these local sort of instabilities, and then you have this almost converged state at t equals 100, where you have these uh, cells basically that form out of this noise. And so you can get this sort of self-organization through this sort of two-component system. So this is another example where we have a spiral that is evolving into something else. So we have the spiral, a rotating spiral, a target pattern, and a stationary localized pulse. So we have these different things that can be sort of uh, patterns that can emerge from this two-component reaction diffusion system. So you can have three or more component reaction diffusion equations as well. These are the belosov shabatinsky reaction, which we'll talk about later. And you have, uh, for blood clotting, we have models that are uh, where we have more than two components, fission waves, or planar gas discharge systems. It is known that systems with more components allow for a variety of phenomena, not possible in systems with one or two components. So for example, we can have stable running pulses in more than one spatial dimension without global feedback if we use more than two components. An introduction and systematic overview of the possible phenomena and dependence of the properties of the underlying system is given in the citation 19. And so 19 is down here, and that is Dissipative silicons and reaction diffusion systems. Mechanisms, dynamics, and interactions is by A.W. Lear. This brings us to our third example here, which is the Fitzhugh Nagumo model. So this is pattern formation in the Fitzhugh Nagumo model. This is a different type of model than the Turing model or the Gray Scott model, but it's still this two-dimensional morphogenesis. So in this paper, we investigate the effect of diffusion on pattern formation in Fitzhugh Nagumo model. Through the linear stability analysis of local equilibrium, we obtain the condition of how the Turing bifurcation, hop bifurcation, which is a different type of bifurcation than Turing, it occurs on a, on a, uh, a tractor basin, and the oscillatory instability boundaries arise. By using the method of weak nonlinear multiple scales analysis and Taylor series expansion, we derive the amplitude equations of the stationary patterns. The analysis of amplitude equations show the occurrence of different complex phenomena, including Turing instability, Eckhaus instability, and zigzag instability. In addition, we apply this analysis to Fitzhugh Nagumo models and find that this model has very rich dynamical behaviors, such as spotted, stripe, and hexagon patterns. The Fitzhugh Nagumo model, this is a famous reaction diffusion system introduced first by Hodgkin and Huxley for the conductance of electrical impulses along a nerve fiber. So the Fitzhugh Nagumo model is a reaction diffusion system, but it has to do with excitable systems or electrical impulses in a system. So some mathematical models for biological neurons, which represent neural behavior in terms of a membrane potential, 
have been developed, and this includes the Hodgkin Huxley model, which we're familiar with for neurons, the Fitzhugh model, the Morris Lacara model, the Hindmarsh Rose model, and especially Hodgkin Huxley model, which is the motivation for the Fitzhugh Nguyen equation that extracts the essential behavior in a simple form. So, this is where we uh, can apply this model in different ways. And it's very similar to the Hodgkin Huxley model in terms of its output. So it, it deals with these kind of excitable systems. Uh, you can model it on a cellular automata to simulate pattern formation and consider the effects of different parameters of the Fitzhugh Nagumo model in changing the initial pattern. So, you know, you have like a cellular automata. You can use that as sort of the basis for rules in that cellular automata. And you can observe, uh, you know, changing patterns on a two-dimensional array. Uh, so uh, Penfilov and Hagelweg found that the spiral breakup occurred spontaneously in the excitable media, which has a shortened relative refractory period and is complicated. The traveling waves, bifurcation, and limit cycle of Fitzsimon and Gumo models, or a modified version as such, have been well studied. The entrainment and modulation of time evolution patterns have not only been investigated numerically in one dimension, but also in Lee and Cho, which is a citation 11 here, find that the shape and type of Turing patterns depend on dynamical parameters and external periodic forcing. So you not only get like Turing patterns that come, that come out of these dynamical parameters, but you also can have external periodic forcing which can modify the shape and type of Turing patterns that we see. Moreover, Pena and Perez show that slightly squeezed hexagons are locally stable in a fork range of distortion angles. So what we have here is we have a version of this two-component reaction diffusion system. It operates in a two-dimensional manner, and it's an excitable system, which means that you can model things like electric potentials, you can model this on a cellular automata, and you can, quite frankly, get uh, refined Turing patterns from this kind of a model. So here's an example, uh, figure 11, where you have pattern formation and the Fitzhugh and Gumo model is working as the way to update these models. So there is coexistence of spotted and straight patterns. So you perturb A at, at a certain level, then you go from this kind of pattern to these kind of patterns. So let's now talk about 3D morphogenesis. So we talked about this already in terms of the belotov jabotinsky reaction. So let's start with that. So this is a belotov jabotinsky reaction. Usually you can see this both in chemical reactions or in bacterial cultures where you have a chemical reaction. And basically it forms these little uh, curved patterns that kind of migrate into one another. So there's a lot of migration here that's going on at these different chemical signals. And you see this in, in a number of chemical systems, also sometimes biological systems. This talks about the excitable nature of polymerizing actin and the BZ reaction. So one example from biology is the excitable nature of polymerizing actin. So in the two-dimensional case, we talked about the Fitzhugh-Nagumo model, which is where we have this excitable system modeled as a two-compartment system. Now we'll talk about the belosov jabotinsky reaction and how that can be used to model polymerizing actin. So the abstract of this paper reads, the intricate regulatory processes behind actin polymerization play a crucial role in cellular biology, including essential mechanisms such as cell migration or cell division. However, the self-organizing principles governing actin polymerization are still poorly understood. We compare the belazov jabotinsky or BZ reaction, a classic and well-understood chemical oscillator known for its self-organizing spatiotemporal dynamics. So the Belzov-Jabotinsky reaction, like the fitzhugh nagumo model, is a chemical oscillator, or at least an oscillator. In fitzhugh nagumo it's an excitable model, which means it could be either electrical or chemical. In Belzov-Jabotinsky, it's more of a chemical oscillator. It deals with these spa self-organizing spatiotemporal dynamics, with, and then in this case, we're modeling the excitable dynamics of polymerizing actin. While the BZ reaction originates from the domain of inorganic chemistry and shares similarities with other organic systems, including the characteristic propagating waves, 
which are influenced by geometry and external fields, and the emerging collective behavior. Starting with a general, general description of emerging patterns, we elaborate on simple single droplets or cell level dynamics, the influence of geometric confinements, and conclude with collective interactions. Belazov Jabotinsky is really about self organization. Think about this in terms of chemical reactions. So we have these different reactions here where we have two chemicals, sulfuric acid and sodium bromate. And then we also have, um, now if we add malonic acid here in the third dimension, we can see that each of these types of uh, reactions or these chemical mixtures form uh, a space of different sorts of properties. So here we have, in this case, sodium bromate and sulfuric acid. We have this red region, and then we have a simple spiral region. We have a meandering spiral region. We have this blue region in the lower right-hand corner. We have turbulence beyond that, and then this convectively unstable spiral. So if you see, we have the red and the blue. They're coming together like we had in the one-dimensional case. But in this dimensional case, we have all these different modes of spiral behavior. So we have all these different types of spiral behaviors in between the red and the blue. And if we look at, like, when we add malonic acid, we actually have a more complex picture. where We have three dimensions where we have this blue region, the red region on the edge, outer edge here, the blue region in the inner edge. And then we have this very rich spiral behavior where we have different spiral modes. Um, and this is, you know, just based on the reaction. So this is a snapshot of what's going on at any one time. This is an example here where we can observe patterns of the spiral formation and the evolution of spiral patterns. So we have these uh, concentric circles here. We have a spiral, and then we have these different types of merging uh, spiral waves. And so this gives us an idea of, you know, the diversity of patterns that you can find. And we can characterize this over time as this self-organization. <clears throat> so figure two describes sort of the mechanistic parallels between that simple chemical system and cell migration. So in A, which is up here, cell migration involves many coordinated steps. In B, we have an oscillating chemical reaction inside a BZ droplet. This results in lo local periodic oscillations. So we have these different sort of parallels of the mechanism. There are different coordinated steps or different dynamics that are going on here. In C, we have droplets encompassing the BZ reaction, which exhibit self-propulsion, advancing forward with each emerging wave. So this is C up here, which as you can see that there's this sort of homogeneous thing that becomes this propagating uh, on this propagating wave front and it's forming a pattern. And you see this in D as well, where you have this comparison uh, between the nucleation frequency of polymerizing actin waves and the speed of aortic endothelial cells migrating at adhesive line patterns. So you see that here. And so in E, you have a traveling wave uh, warm across the communicating oscillator droplet uh, encapsulated within a bilayer membrane, which is here. In F, we have a schematic of an array showcasing six oscillating droplets surrounded by a lipid membrane within an emulsion system. And from the time series, derived space-time plot of each droplet. So that's here. And then G is where we have an image illustrating the collective migration of aortic endothelial cells along the ring-shaped adhesive pattern. So that's here. And so actually when we get to this point, we see that this looks a lot like our two and three-dimensional cases or our two and three-dimensional plots of a BZ reaction. It's very similar. That's the rationale they use to map this to a biological context. And so finally, we can finish the 3D morphogenesis part by talking about morphogenesis and kelp. And so kelp species actually exhibit this kind of morphogenesis as well. So in this case, they talk about the shift to 3D growth during embryogenesis of kelp species. 
then in this paper, they also uh, propose an atlas of cell division and differentiation in this species of kelp. So the abstract reads, in most organisms, 3D growth takes place at the onset of embryogenesis. In some brown algae, 3D growth occurs later in development when the organism consists of several hundred cells. We studied the cellular events that take place in 3D growth as established in the embryo of the brown alga saccharinia, a kelp species. So this is Saccharinia latissima, and oftentimes they'll just use the genus name because we don't necessarily know what the species name is sometimes. So uh, we can't distinguish the species easily. So uh, semi-thin sections taken from our growth shifts from 2D to 3D. So they, they did the sectioning of the uh, specimen. They wanted to look at where growth shifts from two-dimensional context or three-dimensional context. This shows that 3D growth first initiates from symmetrical cell division in the monolayer lamina, and then is enhanced through a series of asymmetrical cell divisions in a peripheral monolayer of cells called the meristodorm. Then daughter cells rapidly differentiate into cortical and medullary cells, characterized by their position, size, and shape. In essence, 3D growth in kelps are based on a series of differentiation steps that occur rapidly after the initiation of bilayered lamina. So again, we get this bilayered lamina, we get these differentiation steps, and we get this pattern formation. So they're not linking this directly to belzov jabotinsky reactions, but this is another part of three-dimensional morphogenesis that, in, in, based on the last paper, we can make some parallels with. Our study depicts the cellular landscape necessary to study cell fate programming in the context of a novel mode of 3D growth. So in phase one, we have a simplified description of uh, growth. So these blue boxes indicate cell growth. So cell growth moves upward in a one-dimensional scale along the x-axis. In phase two, we have this growth along the y-axis as well. So we have growth along the x-axis, but we have multiple one-dimensional arrays, and they can grow, as you see here, you also have this growth along the second dimension, so it's growing wider. And then phase three, we have this depth that emerges along the z-axis, where you get growth in the third dimension. And so you get this expanding system that's migrating outward. So in fact, you have this reaction diffusion system, where you have a signal diffusing in different dimensions. You have cell division. You don't really have the reaction step, but you could consider the reaction step to be maybe analogous to differentiation of cells. Actually, we have kind of a unique model of three-dimensional morphogenesis here. But we can also look at maybe pattern formation in this way, because what we're doing with this model isn't just characterizing the kelp. We're actually characterizing this three-dimensional model of morphogenesis. We have clearly defined steps, and then what we want to do is think about how pattern formation would proceed on this. So in this case, we have maybe like a differentiation aspect to reaction diffusion. So we have reaction diffusion differentiation. The reaction part is undefined. The diffusion part is the movement of these dimensions. And then the differentiation part is where you get differentiation of functions. We can think about this problem in different ways. Finally, I'd like to finish up with this uh, Laplacian growth in bacteria. So we can move out from these different types of morphogenesis to look at something called Laplacian growth. And so this is what we see in bacteria. It almost looks like a belzov jabotinsky reaction, but this is actually not that. So this is what we call Laplacian growth, where we have expansion of one colony, the production of another colony, and one colony is taking over everything. But wait a minute. Now the, the original colony that was expanding is now contracting, and the colony that was contracting down almost a point is expanding again. And so let's see what happens now. We have this other colony in retreat, and then the simulation stops. But you can imagine that this would oscillate over time. This is something we call Laplacian growth, and this is a social media message from Jessica Rosencrantz, and it says bacterial growth can create incredible branching patterns. So that's what you're seeing with Laplacian growth. This animation we created for a biotech company used Laplacian growth algorithms to mimic microbial growth. So this is microbial growth, and they were using the 
Laplacian growth algorithm that simulated this to mimic microbial growth. And so this is something that relates back to some of the things we've talked about with two-dimensional morphogenesis and three-dimensional morphogenesis. And so it's all food for thought, and I'm curious to hear what you have to think about it. And if you're interested in collaborating in any part of this, let us know.